Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. My name is Kirk Barron. My job is to bring you the best thinking in all of dentistry, to sharpen the way you think so you go back and create a better practice and a better life. And have you heard of this amazing woman by the name of Katrina Sanders? If you haven't, you've been living under a rock. She's one of the most gifted educators in all of dentistry. And today we talk about how you can get patients to ask, A-S-K, for treatment. She is awesome. You guys are going to love this episode. And so listen up, and we'll see you soon. Talk about pioneers, truly yes. pioneers, and tell tell us why in the world of Perio. Why, why? Oh my gosh. Why would you put Perio and Pioneer together? Uh, well, for them, they have literally taken whatever the new procedures are, Yakna, et cetera, and they are the, the initial integrators of okay. that. In Perio, that's really important because I think Perio's gotten a bad reputation over the years for doing the same age old procedures over and over again. You know, patients, they hate coming in and getting tissue grafting done because they've seen, you know, 40 years ago, my neighbor had that done and, right. you know, they hate what it looks like or it, was, it, it, it created a lot of pain. In addition, Perio is also one of those professions where we're seeing patients in an asymptomatic disease process. The patients aren't typically in pain. Right. So, for example, your endodontists, uh, a patient's in pain. They, they want that tooth endodontically treated yesterday because they're in pain about it. Or uh, what about your pediatrics? I mean, pediatrics, like you're golden. Like every parent wants to take care of their kids, right? right. But in perio, we have to be true innovators because we are the ones who are fighting that oral systemic link on the front line. Right. And we do see patients that have multimodal comorbidities. So they have to be early adapters to a lot of the pieces. They have to be the ones to move dentistry forward. Because if we don't, what happens? The patient suffers. Yeah. So AZ Perry has been on the front line of all of this, which has just been absolutely incredible. They integrate the newest technologies. They, I mean, we have like pieces of equipment that they've like smuggled over from Europe. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? They want whatever the newest, latest, greatest is, they want it, but they want the research behind it too. Right. So they are constantly looking at that. And our doctors are all absolutely incredible. I'm not just saying that because they pay me. They really right. are absolutely amazing. They care about the patients. They care about the research. They care about success, results, and doing the right thing for the patient. So, yeah. So there's so many amazing. components that I love about this. Number one, you're on the cutting edge of Pun this. Unintended. Cutting edge. You like That's that? Like, yeah. That was yeah, really like that. good. That was really good. You know, yeah, that was yeah. unintended. Is that what? an unintended pun? Unintended pun. I think it is. You are punny. <laughs> <laughs> You are giving me way too much credit. I just enjoy this stuff. So, um, okay. The other thing you guys are going to notice if you're listening carefully is Katrina, you are on a mission. Like this is a cause. This is not just a job. It's not yeah. education. It's way, way bigger than that. So yeah. I can, every time we talk, every time I watch you do something, you are doing something way bigger than just the actual teaching. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Oh gosh. Thank you so much for saying that. You know, it's, so I am, yes, I'm a speaker, I'm a consultant, I'm a writer, I'm a podcaster. I wanted to find any avenue possible for people to hear my voice. Not that I love my own voice, but the reality is every speaker- You do have a great voice. I, oh my gosh, thank I you. I do not, I talk like that. No, you have, a, you have a great voice. I do not have a great voice at all. In fact, if I did have a great voice, I would probably be on Broadway right now. But okay. um, no, I've, I've been wanting to you know, create and share this message because- Early on, when I graduated from hygiene school, like so many people, I was bullied. And I was bullied because when I graduated from hygiene school, I learned the right way to do things. I learned the right way to wipe down an operatory. I learned the right way to take an x-ray so that the quality was there. I right. learned the right way to diagnose a patient, to educate that patient, to not just do the free cleaning the insurance covers because that's what the patient wants, but in reality, they have infection and right. we need to do something more advanced. And I got into a practice where I was bullied by my colleagues around me who said, that's not how we do things here. Oh. And honestly, I was not interested in doing things the way that 
they quote unquote did things around here because that was not in alignment with my core values. Right. And I wanted to create a voice and a space and a community where it was absolutely acceptable and expected for dental professionals to show up and to do the right thing for their patients, to not do subpar or less than care because are we afraid to tell our patients about the disease process they have? Are we afraid of being told no so we don't even diagnose or treatment plan the patient appropriately? What is getting in the way of us doing the correct things? Right. And then, of course, as you know, most stories like this unfold, um, I sadly, tragically, unexpectedly lost my mom. Actually, uh, yesterday was the four-year anniversary of her oh, passing. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So, thank you. Um, and I lost her uh, due to uh, complacency in the medical profession. They, um, they knew she had a problem. They didn't talk to her about it. They didn't you know, prescribe the correct treatment. They did the bare minimum standard which is just enough so that the doctor couldn't get sued. Not that my family is the type that would ever sue a doctor. We, you know, we wouldn't want to do that, but they did the bare minimum, which is just enough to feel like I did the bare minimum. But my mom would be here today if she had seen a physician who said, Linda, this is not right. We need to look into this. We need to address this. And I think about how many times we in dentistry see patients that are experiencing comorbidities or we're looking down the airway of the patient and we know that there's something going on with this patient and who are we to withhold that information? Yeah. So uh, I'm on a mission. I want to be able to create and normalize that. And to your point, it's a tireless journey. You know, I, I leave my dogs behind. I leave them with a dog sitter. I leave my fiance at home. I'm on the road. I am like in and out of like every airport in the country. (laughs) I'm doing it. Um, not, because I want to be thanked or be a hero, but because I really do believe in the dental profession. And I believe that we want to step in and be that preventive specialist in the industry. And I don't mean just the industry of dentistry. Right. I mean the industry of healthcare. Yeah. It is amazing what you're up to. So take us through the journey. So when you're at AZ Perio, how did you jump into, now I know a little bit of the story because you've shared it with me. So you started the journey and another thing I want you to incorporate in the story, you're leaving it out. You're leaving out a big piece of this. You are a sommelier. I totally did not even spell that. You didn't spell it right. No, it was terrible. I, you know, you're not going to get a lot of points on my spelling. There's an A at the end of that. Is there? Uh, is it, there's no. not supposed to be, but there is well, I, I on can, your card. It's my, it's my, it's in the world of according to, what do you say? World the, ac- the world according to Kirk. There I you like go. It. There yeah. you go. I like what it. What would Kirk do? <laughs> you don't, you don't want to read that book. Okay. So take us through the journey, how you got started on it. You're a sommelier. You're out speak Like you're, yeah. this is pretty rare. You're a genius speaker. You're changing the world. You're influencing this great profession. You're gifted in wines. You know oh what I mean? Gosh, so in so research, kind. like you're like a triple yeah. threat. Oh, <laughs> so. is, that, is that what it is? Wine Wines, dentistry research. There you go. That's there you go. Yep, yep. Okay. So how did, how did that all come to be? Give oh us a gosh. little, give us the timeline. Here. So yeah. So the Cliff Notes version, it, the Kirk Notes version, okay. we'll call it. Is, right. um, I, I was practicing dentistry, loved it. Um, I started teaching dental hygiene. I was in education for many years and love teaching. Um, But I did have some challenges with being in institutionalized education. Um, And so I left education and I tried to figure out what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I bought this guided journal. And the guided journal said, um, you know, this is one of those, like, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life. Okay. So they're asking you these guided questions. It's a journal? Get you there. That yeah, helps it's a journal. You? Yeah. And so you fill in the blank, you know. So the question asked, if you could do whatever you wanted for the rest of your life and money was no object, what would you do? And wow. the thing is, um, you know, after you spend two weeks in Greece on Yacht Week or whatever you're doing, you, you know, for somebody who's a purpose-driven individual, mm-hmm. you need to have something that, that zaza zing that like wakes you up in the morning and gets you going. Right. right. So if you could literally live your best life, what would that life be? Right. And I wrote, I would drink wine, talk about dentistry and save homeless animals. Okay. That's what I wrote. That's that like, is how pretty weird is that, awesome. Right? That okay. Is, yeah. Thank you. I mean, now at the time I'm like, this is awesome. But yeah. when I wrote that, I'm like, how ridiculous like, it's not who's, though. Who's going to build a business and make money drinking, like just being like drinking wine, talking about dentistry and saving homeless animals? Like who does that? Hey, the message here, there's no rules. That's, and that is the message. Yeah. There are no rules. You can make your own rules. Literally, I am here drinking wine with you, my wines. Cheers. Cheers to that. And you have to, oh, we got the red. We're going to talk about the wines here. In drinking second. my wines, talking about dentistry, 
and serving underserved populations along the way. Yeah. So this is really a story about like, a, what is it? A, not a dream deferred. You know what I mean? Like it's, we're not talking about like putting your dreams aside. This was me identifying right now that I had an opportunity to really create something different. Yeah. And I did that. So um, I, I immediately thought this is ridiculous. I put the journal away. I thought this is insane. Nobody's ever going to make a business off of this. And then my previous students started to ask me to build programmatic content. They're like, hey, Miss Sanders. They still called me Miss Sanders, even though they had graduated. I, like that, yeah. I know, so cute. <laughs> Miss Sanders, will you do some CE courses for us on, you know, anesthesia and will you write on infection control? And I thought, sure, I'll do that. And I had a VIP membership with a local wine bar down in Old Town Scottsdale. So I could use their back room for free. Very cool. So I thought, great, that's exactly what I'll do. So um, I used their back room. I had to buy a case of wine. So I, during these programs, I would do CE courses out of their back room, serve wine. And I thought, well, I was studying for my SOM at the time. So I thought I'll, you know, walk them through a wine tasting. Right. It's going to help me study for my SOM and they're going to get this amazing experience. From there, uh, you know, people, t turns out, absolutely love that. Uh, dentistry loves wine. Why is you that? May, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Something about the stressful patients or something. Right. Dentistry loves drinking wine. Okay. So I started to build out this content and paired it alongside wines. And it, it just, it took off like wildfire. I was overselling the courses. People wanted to learn more. Yeah. So of course, uh, I started to build a brand called the Dental Wine Genist. And it was a provocative brand because it turns out if you can put a glass of wine in somebody's hand and they sip it, then you can say provocative things and dentistry is a lot more open and amendable to hearing it. For sure, for sure. If you want to be a game changer, I mean, one of my favorite quotes, not to get political, but Michelle Obama said, if you want to create true change, you must be comfortable saying something uncomfortable. Right. And so I had to start saying out loud on stages because this was my mission. Why are we not perio charting our patients? Yeah. Why are you skipping looking through the patient's medical history? Why are you not asking the patient about the medications they're on? Why are you skipping taking vital signs? Why does your practice not even do those things? Yeah. Why do you skip the oral cancer screening if a patient is running late? Why do you value that, canceling that over maybe telling the patient, I don't have time to polish your teeth today? Yeah. Why are you doing these things? And in order to be provocative, I was serving wine. Yeah, but you're not really like, you're not trying to go out on a limb and like, no, no, you're just asking truthful questions. Right. Like you're just challenging Right. The, the, the whole why behind what you're doing. You're, you are also, I will say this, you have to describe there's different levels of psalm. You, you mm -hmm. shared that last time. Like, look at me, I'm throwing around slang. Now. I know. <laughs> oh, so, I'm a, so you're a psalm. <laughs> what, what level? I'm a level one. Okay. So I'm, yeah. a, I'm not. A, you're, you're, you're a, a pre <laughs> I'm a psalm like wannabe. In, in Am I in pre psalm? I'm in pre psalm. <gasps> I like that. That's good. <laughs> so, um, but you're also really well versed in the the literature, yeah. And the and you constantly get challenged, which I love. Yes. And you're very classy. How should I say that? In how you're Thank challenged, you. you're never like, oh yeah, you want to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, you're like, okay, so sure. mm -hmm. okay, so let's go back to the psalm level. There's different levels of psalm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I take my exam. Okay. As you saw, my pass on the first try, which was amazing because okay. everybody I was in the room with, they like all work in the industry and okay. I'm just like some dental hygienist that drinks wine in her kitchen. So I was so excited. I passed. Um, and I, I did, I start, started building out content where I was getting hired and I okay. started traveling, which was amazing. And I was getting challenged. I was getting challenged mostly because I don't think people expected someone in a Calvin Klein dress, high heels, curled red hair pink font on their slides to actually know what she was talking about. People were reading me right. and making assumptions about me. And I will say, I think part of the important piece to all of this was for me as a dental hygienist to be sharing that message. Right. The vast majority of the judgment that I do get, or a lot of the questions that I get are from doctors who don't believe that a dental hygienist would be able to have the savvy to look into the research and to have that research readily available on their slides. Oh, and how wrong are they? And how wrong, are, and, and, and that is the reality. There are, you know, I don't, I don't speak for all hygienists. I'm not a voice for all hygienists. Okay. I know that there are hygienists out there that want to show up, clock in, clock out, right. you know, don't want to go the extra mile for their patients. 
I'm not an advocate for those hygienists, but right. there are plenty of hygienists out there that I interact with that slide into my DMs that consistently are emailing me that care so much about their patients that they're there on a Saturday learning about CE and still emailing me about it afterwards and wanting to learn how they can do better. Right. I want to be a voice for those hygienists because they really are the, we are the, like the oral health practitioners of dentistry. Right. We are there and we should be partnering with our doctors. And totally. Part of that is we need to let our doctors know we do understand the research. We have to know the research in order to graduate from hygiene school. And even afterwards, I'm honored to be a, a respected speaker in the dental space. I don't say dental hygiene space. I'm in the dental space right. where I am presenting that content and the small font down at the bottom of my slides. That's my research. You can always track back to that every time. Right. That's an important piece of the puzzle. Yeah. I love how you're charting your own path and to give us the, I don't have this on my cards, but the real, what's the real challenge in the world of education right now in this conversation? Because this topic mm -hmm. is an extremely important one. I think everybody would agree. Yes, it what's is. What's the real challenge? Give us like, because you're sharp. You Like what's the real problem in the world? Is it, is it not enough? Um, is it that we're not fighting for the right thing? Do we not have enough information? Is it too, is it too big that people don't want to pivot and listen? Like, what's the real challenge for you? Okay, I'm going to say something. Go. It's going to be, really, go it's gonna be provocative, though. Oh, so wait, just, you, you, already, you already gave us... <laughs> I got you wind up. Hey, so don't worry. The network will not shut us down. Okay, good. Yeah, keep us going. <laughs> keep those cameras rolling. Yeah. Um, so it, it is that dentistry is very reluctant to change. Tell us why. You know... We are so used to doing the same thing. Hygienists, every hour on the hour, right. we do the same thing. There's a, a profile sometimes to an individual who chooses a profession where you do the same thing every hour on the hour, yet you are extremely educated. You mm. know what I mean? So we're, we're in a situation where we know too much and we are just like screaming to jump out of this rigmarole of the eight to five, every patient, we know these patients. Right. Oh yeah. You know, uh, Tim's coming in and oh, he declines that treatment plan every time. And here we go. And yet the reality is when we start to institute education, that does create an expectation on dentistry to instill change. Oh, and for it sure. is disruptive. And it's interesting that there are other professions, other industries the electronics industry is a great example. You know, um, there was a point in time where, you know, if you would have told me 20 years ago that I would have a camera, I would have all my music, yeah. that I would have the internet, that I would have my email on one device, I'd say, there's no way. Right. But we look to electronics, the, the tech industry to disrupt, to create new things. And we get excited about those things. Right. We want the brand new Tesla. We want the brand new smart TV. So dentistry is one of those professions that very much struggles to be early adopters in change. And yet the pandemic told us that we were going to have to make changes, yeah. whether, you know, ready or not, here it comes. We have to change what we're wearing. When we see our patients, we have to change how we're screening our patients. We have to change the conversation. We have to change some of our infection control modalities. And we did it. Right. So dentistry is well aware that they are capable of making changes. And yet when it really comes down to instilling that change, it means that we would have to disrupt what we know. Well, somebody's got to lead the change. Somebody has to lead that change. And I'm, I'm trying to do it. You're I'm not trying. trying. To do it. With You're a wine glass it. in You're hand, doing I'm doing it. Darn it. Okay. <laughs> I have like 90 more questions oh and we got gosh, people that are that. coming in. I need you to tell the story of the wine. Like oh. how did the wine come to be? Cause it's bigger than wine. It is bigger than wine. Okay. It is. Yeah. And then eventually at some point we got to talk about the course you're oh, giving the thing to, I'm gonna do no no this is, I like stories I know I, I like stories, stories way stories more too. than okay so I take take us through the story of the wine so I started to really build a lot um, in the way of being able to speak I was busy I was on the road I was delivering programmatic content and I found that even though I was called the dental wine genist I was spending more time in the dental part and not the wine genist part and um, you know, as it were, I mentioned that we lost my mom, um, in December of 2020, we lost my dad, um, actually to another inadequacy wow. in the medical profession. Yeah. Um, dad had walking pneumonia, his doctor did not know, and he passed. Um, and I was absolutely devastated. Two weeks later, I meet this guy and he is kind and he's got this like, you know, sweet Midwest charm to him. And I was just not in a space in my heart and in my life to be meeting somebody, but I thought I'll, I'll give it one last chance. And we start having this just like amazing, like swirl of a romance, like just incredible. 
And as we started to get to know each other, you know, and I started to share with him some of my goals and some of my dreams, I shared, you know, one of the pieces that I really want to focus more on is being the wine genist, not the dental wine genist, but really letting the wine um, aspect of my brand and my business start to evolve. And he asked me, well, what would that look like? And I said, I'm just going to say it out loud. And it, mm. it was one of those like early on when I was scribbling, drink wine, talk about dentistry, save homeless animals. Like right. I wrote that privately. Like nobody was supposed to know that I wrote right. that. Right? But now I was going to say it out loud to another human where there was maybe going to be accountability. There's a possibility it might manifest itself in reality. It might <laughs> actually happen, the things I say out loud, right? right? So I said, I want my own line of wines. Okay. That's what I want to do. I want to do my own line of wines. And he said to me, okay then let's make that happen. Right. And I thought he was just as insane as I am, which is actually really great. Well, that's a good combination. It is a good combo. Yeah. Two insane people together, yeah. right? So we started, um, you know, curating what that would look like. Okay. And wouldn't you know it, uh, the winemaker that we worked with is uh, Lisa Strid from Eridus Wine Co., which is the wine company where I developed and delivered my very first programmatic content five years ago. In Old Town Scottsdale. In Old Town Scottsdale, okay. yes. So that's, that's where these wines come from. So uh, we started to collaborate with Lisa and started to build these wines out. And I said to Dale, I said, what I want is for these wines to be able to give back to the community awesome. because I want to drink wine, talk about dentistry, save homeless animals. I want to be able to support the underserved. Yeah. So um, he said, okay. So we built out these wines. Uh, we currently have a white and a red blend um, that Lisa and I built out together. Um, and the proceeds from these particular wines will be supporting the underserved dental needs in the Republic of Rwanda. Okay, currently. you got to tell that story too. Oh my gosh. You've already shared that, but that's a pretty powerful it story. It, it's, it is amazing. It wasn't um, on logic. It wasn't like a well thought out plan. No, it, nothing is ever well thought <laughs> out. You know, that's like the method to the madness, you know? Um, yeah. So uh, about gosh, eight, 12 weeks ago now, we went to Rwanda. Okay. Um, I felt very called, very pulled to go to Rwanda. And uh, I was introduced to Dr. Thomas Lee, who is actually an American trained dentist. He um, moved to Rwanda when he retired. And now he does all humanitarian work in addressing the dental needs in Rwanda. And so um, for the listeners who understand the genocide, the insurgents that happened in 1994, this republic was absolutely crippled yep. by what happened. Um, the the um, war on the Tutsi people by the Hutus just absolutely devastated this country. And they are still trying to rebuild. Um, in fact, uh, when we were in Rwanda, there was a day that we did, uh, we visited the silverbacks in the volcanoes which was amazing. That's um, one of only two places in the world where the silverbacks naturally live now. They're extremely endangered. And we're walking through the volcanoes and I said to Dale, it's amazing. These volcanoes were one of the places where the Tutsi people were lured and then slaughtered by the Hutu people. And it was incredible as we were hiking down, you still saw small little pieces of fabric embedded in the ground from the bodies that they had to remove from the volcanoes. Oh. That is how much they are still trying to clean and rebuild the country. This happened in 1994. So Dr. Lee is there and he is doing everything he can to, you know, manage oral care there, but it is catastrophic oral care. It is extraction of infected teeth, excise and drain. It is not preventive care. They just, they're not in that space. Right. And I right. want to be able to create that change. So we went to Rwanda. Uh, Dr. Lee was amazing. We had an incredible time. We met the most amazing, kind, gracious people. And I want to be able to continue educational programs there. It's not about me being there and putting sealants on 20 children's teeth that day. It's about me educating the educators right. so they can go and they can then create the change that they want to see in their community. It's sustainability. Yeah. So we built out these wines. And the best part about this story is we build these wines, right? And we decide that we're going to have this giant launch party yeah. in Phoenix, Scottsdale, right? And our friends and family come in. We invite everybody there. And I'm so nervous because this is the first time that we're going to launch our wines for the public. Everybody's going to see it, you know? So I'm, you know, focused on mm -hmm. trying to make sure everything is perfect. I've got a little speech planned and everything. And I do my speech. I introduce the white wine. 
And then it's Dale's turn. He's going to introduce the red wine. Okay. And so he introduces the red for everybody and, oh, these are the notes you're going to get and blah, 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 blah. And then all of a, I'm, and I'm listening to him talk and he's, he's so cute. He's doing a great job, you know? And then all of a sudden I look down and he's down on one knee with a ring box. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me this. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So this is, uh, it's, it's a love story. It's a yeah. love story about the love I have for dentistry, the love I have for wine. Um, I do believe that dad sent Dale to me That's awesome. with every fiber of my being. Um, and there were so many little moments in that day that were little winks from dad. Like yeah. he was there. Um, and these wines are the manifestation of that. Yeah. Five years later, I'm drinking wine. They are delicious. Okay. You got to talk about each one. Why are the, what is it? Okay. Because it's so a white, white blend. This, yeah. So this white blend, this is, um, it's a Malvasia Bianca okay. Sauvignon Blanc Viognier blend. So these are not common white wines that the average wine drinker would experience. Normally right. it's a Pinot Grigio or Chardonnay. Um, so these are very unique grapes. They come to us from Wilcox, Arizona. Uh, yes, we do grow grapes in Arizona. I did not know that. Which is so fun. So um, this is a beautiful, uh, heavy tropical notes on this one. You're going to get a lot of fruit forwardness. It's just absolutely amazing. And the uh, title of this one is called the nine to five. Why? So Tell us why. It's called the nine to five because, <laughs> and the label itself is a, a picture of um, a dental professional in the operatory and they've got a thought bubble and they're thinking about wine. Yeah. So the nine to five is, you know, you're in the operatory and the patients show up late and they're stressing you out and some, you know, the crown doesn't get seated the right way or you can't remove that piece of calculus, but you continue doing your best because that is what your patients deserve. Very cool. This is the nine to five. Of I dentistry. love it. That's so, so cool. That is our white, um, which I absolutely love. Um, we serve it with a light chill on it. So yeah. and you would have this way. with, uh, now I know the least this would be with like a fish or yes, like maybe yes. some tea, which I'm we, sorry, sommelier. <laughs> okay. I'm a pre song. <laughs> Pre-som. Pre-som. I'm in pre <laughs> Yeah. Something and so light, a cheese, a cheese of some kind. Very light. Yeah. Very light cheeses. Yeah. You don't want to like, you, if you're going to do like a blue cheese or like a heavier, like Gouda and, or something, you're going to go to the red. But and I, earlier in our, you said it was, it was like a pool wine. Would you say? Oh, I call it a pool sipper. Oh, you know pool what I mean? sipper. Where you yeah. just want to like sit by the pool and just have yeah, this. Yeah. I like that. It's absolutely mm. delicious. Mm -hmm. well, cheers Wonderful. To that. Then I have the red. Okay. The red is a Syrah Petite Syrah blend. So again, two slightly unique reds. Right. Um, you know, usually you're talking about a Pinot Noir or a Cab, right? That you're, right. most people drink. So it's a little bit different. It's got um, some big bright fruits on it though. So you're going to get big red fruits, Bing cherries, um, plum. It does have um, almost a hint of raisin in mm -hmm. it too. You can get a little bit of that um, kind of uh, baking spice on the back with this one, which right. is really nice. Okay, so I need some help. So I'm in pre -som, Okay, pre yes, okay, so studying. Yeah. Now you've, everyone yeah. tells you like how to sip wine. Like you're uh -huh. supposed to, I've heard everything. Yeah. And yeah. I, I have seen, what's the movie? The movie, uh, uh, you know which movie yeah, I'm talking the, about. Yeah, with Sandra O. Oh. No, sideways. the two guys. Yeah, yeah, they sideways. Sideways. They yeah. go to Napa. They go to Napa and they gave um P uh no Merlot. They like hated on Merlot. Yeah, he's like, Ever? no more Merlot. That's yeah, not exactly. No what more we Merlot, said. but Merlot's actually really great. I know, but like so how do you what's the correct way? Okay. You do you do have to breathe. It's gotta Well, there there are five S's of wine tasting, which oh, we'll God. actually walk through this <laughs> evening. Yeah. So the first one is C. You look at the wine to, okay. you know, you just want to look at the color, contour, texture, consistency, all of that. Okay. Then the second is you're gonna swirl. You want to be able to aerate the wine. So I usually do that with the wine on the table. Dale gave me quite a pour here. So we're just gonna do a light little swirl. That aerates the wine, oxygenates okay. it. Um, then the third is you're gonna sniff. Sniff. So you sniff and that sniff allows for the olfactory bulb to actually communicate with the wine and for you to be able to build an early opinion about the wine. Yeah. Uh, then the fourth is when you actually sip it. Sip it. So to sip the wine, the first sip never counts. I always say that. You just want to coat your mouth with the first sip, okay. which you've done actually successfully well at this point. Well, this is my second glass. <laughs> yeah, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> so you sip and what you'll see psalms do is they'll take a little bit in their mouth and then they're actually going to pull in oxygen, which allows for aeration of the wine okay, so, while it's in your mouth. So like this? Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it's much, mm -hmm. you can get the, um, 
You got much more on the front w- palate Watch that this, way? watch this. I'm going to use the word fruit forwardness. Okay, there you Is go. Is that good? Are you getting the raisin? I am. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. a, it's a little, uh, it's a, like a dark, mm-hmm. dark cherry or mm-hmm. like a, mm. mm-hmm. wow. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. Quite different than just regularly sipping. That's right. Yeah. So we study in some school actually a lot about taste buds, but also because you're pulling this uh, wine in through your mouth and you do want it to splash all areas of your mouth because the olfactory bulb communicates with the floor of the palate. Right. So it does give you another opportunity to experience the wine. Um, so they tell you to pull it pull in air and then chew it three times and then swallow it. Very cool. So that's how you sip it. And then of course the fifth S is savor. That's about savor. Part. So savors where you really enjoy it. Just to enjoy it. Yep. So this red is called the five to nine. So this, <laughs> <laughs> this is, See, yeah, you're right? sharp. You're there sharp. You okay. So what, what so does the that five mean? To nine is when you're done with work and you are exhausted, um, and you're drained, and you peel off your scrubs, and you're like, I'm done. I had one of those days. I'm over it. And yet, you're still thinking about your patients, and you're still thinking about dentistry, yeah, and you still true. listen to that dental podcast, and you're still reading that dental magazine, and you're still spending your weekends going to dental CE, because yeah. once a dental professional, always a dental professional. You cannot take the dental, well, you can take the dental professional or the op, but you can't you take the op out of the person. Oh so, my gosh. There it is. Outstanding. This is it. I am so cheers. proud of you. This oh, is going to be so thank cool. Thank you. I'm excited. Oh, this is awesome. Oh. Now, um, so Andy's like, okay, so we're going to do a half hour. No, we're going to do an yeah, hour and a half. I know. No, people yeah, are going to come in here any second now. So like, yeah. uh, I do want to talk about, this is amazing. I'm, you guys, you got to try this. And well, Thank first you. of all, you got to follow you on social media. I yes. would say that you are truly, it's such a unique footprint that you've created. Like there's not, no one's doing what you're doing. Like it's very unique. It's fun. The dental wine genus. You just, right. I mean, you could, you're, I mean, so your main your main media is probably Instagram. Instagram, yep, yep. Instagram. Although I put a lot of my stuff on Instagram on LinkedIn. Okay. And I do that intentionally because I do think that LinkedIn is a bit buttoned up. Right. And I think part of dentistry's challenge is that we are too buttoned up. Okay. You know what I mean? We're too. It's like okay, unbutton that white lab coat, calm down. You right. know what I mean? Like the only way that we're going to get there and really create the change that we need to see is if we sit down and. And have the conversations with each other. Right. And stop being so fearful that people are judging us. Totally. If you're struggling to remove that piece of calculus, go ask your colleague next door. Hey, I'm struggling to remove this calculus. I need help. Yeah. Instead of ignoring it and then the patient suffers. 100%. We have to be able to do that. So, uh, so that's what I do. And so, yeah, you'll see me on Facebook, LinkedIn, and of course, Instagram. And then our wine company is also on Instagram. We are the wine op. Ooh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, the wine the op. Wine op. Yep. OP. OP. Yep. So we recognized early on that uh, you are a hero in the op, yeah. in the operatory, but also there are plenty of other ways that you can serve the community outside of the op yeah. through opportunities. Yeah. You're like the OG and the OP. You like that? I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know me. <laughs> We could have a whole bunch of fun. We're going to, that'll be the next course that you yeah. give here. I th- yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this <laughs> is going to be so much fun. So, okay. So you got to mm-hmm. teach, you got to tell, now I'm just saying like you are incredible at being able to create a fantastic, um, you know, educational experience. What are we going to be learning tonight? These oh people are coming here yes. tonight. It's a two hour program. Yes. And um, the title, as you can see, is getting them to ASK. For, for, for treatment. treatment. Yes. So what does that stand for? Like, oh first of all, what are we going to be learning tonight? And what does that mean? Tell I us what it. that means. So the ASK technique is how yeah. we're going to use our assessments to build a strategy so that our patients ask us for the treatment based on the knowledge they now have. About I, their love I love it. I love it. You're going to take everybody the through treatment. the ASK. The ASK. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm want to dial it back. I don't think it should be about case acceptance. Okay. I think it should be about the patient asking us for the treatment. Okay, back up. You got to explain that. We yeah. need we need our patients to understand the why. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted of trying to talk to patients and convince them they have a disease process they don't believe they have. Right. So this is really our way of creating a different dynamic of shifting that focus to helping the patient confront their disease process right. through co-discovery. When I got my master's degree in educational leadership, I focused a lot on that. How do you help adults learn? And they don't want some know-it-all ginger from Phoenix, Arizona to sit there and go, this is what you have and this is what you need. Maybe back in the day, 20, 30, 40 years ago, if you were a doctor and you had a white lab coat, they believed whatever you said. Right. 
But now with WebMD and you can, you know, Dr. Google and all that jazz, it's, you know, people are questioning. Right. I don't want to, I don't want to simplify this too much, but it almost has to be their idea. 100%, which is why, and you'll hear this tonight. I want to walk participants through how do you get the patient when, once you set them up after their assessments to go, it sounds like we have a problem. Mm. And for you as the professional to go, yeah. Because you can't really go to solution until we get until to that point. The problem, right? Right. It's what is it? Problem, consequence, solution. If they don't understand the problem, right. they don't care about the consequence, and they sure as heck aren't going to care about the solution. Right. So we have to take it back to how are we going to provide the patient with the knowledge that there is a problem yeah. and have them accept that. Yeah, and let me just point out a, a blind spot. Like this is extra special because hygienists or clinical team members are not equipped with this stuff. They're no. just, a, you're just hired and expected 100% to know this stuff. 100%. We are. And, and when you're in hygiene school, you're taught how to talk to the patient about periodontal disease, but you are not taught to talk to the patient about some of their barriers. Right. You know what I mean? That patient is usually your family member or your friend and they're, they're stuck in that chair. Yeah. Now you enter the real world and you have to figure out insurance is a, you know, is a motivator for patients slash finances, um, you know, their time, um, the patient questioning you because that isn't your family member or friend. That's, you know, um, your, you know, four o'clock patient coming in and they are inquisitive and they maybe don't trust you. Right. And so you have to build that. And how do you build that? Right. So that the patient understands the why. Yeah. And so I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm so excited for you on so many oh. fronts. Number one, you're fun to listen to. You're making waves here. Thank you. This topic is not going away. No. I mean, the whole perio, kind of, I mean, I ask dentists all the time, how important is perio? And they go, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. and they get all fired up. You yeah, know, it is. This it's is the foundation of it all. It is. It is. You know, and the systemic link. I mean, this conversation is going to be going on for a long time. Yes. You know, and as a provider, as somebody who helps people, you know, change their health. I mean, there are dentists that fix teeth and there are dentists that change lives. And it's not the same business. Would you agree? I love how you just said that. You were spot on. Yeah, I've been, I've been using it. You can, you, you can borrow that. I can actually, I borrow I, that? No, I heard somebody else say it. So oh, like, okay. it's not mine. I was going to copyright it you. So <laughs> I can't, okay. No, nothing I say <laughs> is that intelligent. I just, I just take a ton. See, you just hang out with intelligent people. No. And then you write what, down in your note cards. I'm going to give you my whole secret. Tonight, you're going to be talking. I'm going to be writing as fast as possible. Half of it, I won't even be able to read. Yeah. But like, I'm totally going to borrow it and pay it forward. And then I people go, that. you're so smart. I'm like, no, I went to yeah. a, I went to a Katrina course. It's a Katrina Sanders. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Give credit where credit is due. You're referencing. I'm referencing. It's a reference. It's it. a reference. <laughs> but really, you know, if you go to a good course or yeah. anything, it's, you can, you can put all this stuff together to help the people you serve. It's so cool. Absolutely. I am Absolutely. so pumped for you. Like oh I, my gosh. this I is going to be so fun. And I just I got to meet this. Dale. I got to, yes. I got this wine. You know, you brought a whole bunch of wine. Mm-hmm. Four or five bottles are going to magically disappear just in my backpack. Yes. So that's Amazing so cool. Amazing how that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I am so grateful. Oh, so thank you for being cheers. here. I love it. Thank Any you last so much thoughts you have before we, before no, we say goodbye to I anybody? I just have to say thank you for bringing me to Milwaukee. This is amazing. It's so great to be back here. So thank you and cheers to you and the amazing team of Act Dental. Now, thank wait you. a minute. Before you leave Milwaukee, you're going to go to the airport and there's going to be a t-shirt stand and you're going to see it. There's like three of them. And okay. Milwaukee is called the what? It's called the blank land. Do you know what it's called? Like, do you have you seen those t-shirts? No. It's called the good land. The good land? Oh, yeah. I was going to say the bubbler land. Yeah. No, it's called, it's called the good land. Andy, do you know the story behind the good? You know, yeah, you yeah. do. So he, He's like, you just wrap it up. Stop talking. <laughs> he's doing the wrap it up thing. It is oh the gosh. good. Oh, we got to wrap it up. He's, he's like, take, we got to go. We got to go. All right. So uh, all to, right. Well, to the good land. To then. the good land. Yes, to the good cheers, land. Cheers, so cheers thank you guys for being there. Thank you guys for listening to the best practices show. Hey, if you enjoyed today, do us a favor. Follow the dental wine genus. Check out nine to five and then five to nine. Mm-hmm. They fit together really well. They do. Yeah, I think so. And if you're a dental professional, like who's just looking to get your team excited on these very, very important concepts, I'm just telling you, Katrina Sanders is your person. And if you have a study club and you haven't hired her to speak, what are you thinking? Like, (laughs) (laughs) you got to do it. So I love that. It's awesome. Well, thank you for being here and thank you guys for listening. And uh, until we see you guys next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practice show. You guys enjoy your day. (laughs) 